Welcome to episode 11 of the Inner Sanctum, the internet's one and only dark ambient vlog. I am your host, my name is Joe. Well, it's been a really, really long time since the last episode, over three months, and uh, I have to start off by apologizing for the great delay in episodes, but uh, after I got done filming the last episode, which was late March, and I think it premiered on like August, uh, April 5th or 6th, I fell into just a really big rut, just a deep depression throughout all of April and May, and I really didn't get out of it until late June when me and my um, girlfriend went on a vacation, and I was finally able to, like, I guess rebalance myself and kind of just get out of this uh, deep depression, this existential crisis I was kind of going through, and uh, a big catalyst for that was just because throughout all of April and May, it just rained and rained and rained every fucking day, and I don't know if you guys are affected by the weather like I am, but my mood is very circumstantial to the weather, so I gotta make sure I never move to a place that is known for raining a lot, because when it rained for like two months straight here, I fucking was coming unglued, and I was just losing my shit, and it was really, really bad. And uh, during that whole period, I was just, I lost touch of everything. I just, uh, I wasn't working on music, I obviously wasn't doing these vlogs or anything, I was just existing, and not so much in a way that I like to exist, because I like to keep myself busy, always being creative, and just just always moving, always doing something. And it's it's both a, a good and a bad thing. It's bad because I almost never relax, but good because I'm always productive, and if I'm productive, I feel like I'm doing something. My life's actually worthwhile. So it's been three months since the last episode, and uh, I have to say, during these warmer months of the year, now that they're finally here, I don't listen to dark ambient music as much, and. Uh, it kind of goes back to that whole, you know, weather thing. It's sort of, I, I've always been very, uh, I guess the weather often determines what I listen to. I don't know if that's a weird thing to say or not, but like, I guess it's just sort of like how a lot of people like to listen to black metal music in the winter time, as opposed to when it's 85 degrees outside, which it is today and going to be for the next several days here in Wisconsin. So it's, I, I guess, you know, dark candy music to me, is you know you could listen to any situation but it's a little bit different i guess when it's your birds chirping outside your window it's super warm and all that kind of stuff and uh i guess that gloom and all that kind of stuff kind of goes well with dark games because it's dark and it's you know it's gloomy music so it goes well with winter months and i, I guess even during april and may when i was feeling so depressed i probably should have been listening to a lot of dark ambient music but it wasn't i was just trying to listen to more optimistic, energetic music genre and just kind of get myself out of that rut, but it only kind of worked and mostly I was miserable. Uh, anyway, I have to apologize and uh, I oh, know I always say this, but I want to try to make more episodes and I know in episode 10 I sort of spinned a little yarn about doing this cryo chamber special when I came back and I was planning to come back like two or three weeks later with that episode, but obviously that hasn't happened. And Unfortunately, it will not be happening for this episode either, but I definitely want to plan it for a future episode and possibly the next one, but I don't want to make any promises. But it's definitely going to happen because it's something I really want to do, and uh, this is probably going to be a little bit shorter episode. I'm only going to talk about three albums this time around, but I think it'll be worth it, and I think it's a good way to come back, and uh, hope you guys enjoy it. Of course, what would the Inner Sanctum be without the year of the show? Today I'm drinking Kentucky Vanilla Barrel Cream Ale, brewed by Kentucky Brewing in Lexington, Kentucky. Um, this is already my third one of the night, I have to say this is fantastic. It basically tastes like a cream soda pop, but it's alcoholic, and uh, <laughs> which is pretty awesome, but good and bad because it goes down really quickly and really well. and. Uh, Probably a good thing it doesn't have a lot of alcohol because I would probably be wasted by the end of the show otherwise. But uh, anyway, here's the pour. And as you can see, I'm pouring it into my unholy chalice this time around. Nah, it's actually a normal chalice. Pour is a nice, uh, well, just as a uh, kind of you kind of expect a a cream soda color. It's got a nice head on it and. Uh, Smells of uh, basically cream, caramel, toffee, and tastes like a delicious cream soda, but it'll get you drunk. 
So, highly recommended. This is the Kentucky Vanilla Barrel Cream Ale from Kentucky Brewing. And let's get to the dark ambience. Up first is a newcomer from North Carolina who I have to admit really took me by surprise. His name is Mambe Yulman. Uh, Mambe's music career, at least his solo career, goes back to April of last year when he debuted with an EP of IDM and electronica avant-garde kind of stuff. And uh, more recently, he's branched out into the various subgenres of ambient, in particular cinematic dark ambient kind of soundtrack sounding stuff. And uh, he first got in contact with me a few months ago to, to basically uh, upload or, or to check out his then new release called Point Pleasant. And I have to admit, when uh, artists send me their digital albums, I'm somewhat, I guess, hesitant to check them out because I, I just prefer records and cassettes and CDs so much. So oftentimes when album artists send me those albums, they just sit on my desktop or my, my McDonald's folder for months on end sometimes. But I got this one pretty quickly just because I think I'd gone, I had been anything to listen to at the time, and I was actually really blown away by it, and I couldn't believe that I'd let it sit there for a few weeks and without checking it out. So I was really curious to see what he would do next, and uh, more recently he has just released his new album called Race of Appalachian. It's part of his Cryptid Collection. And this is the limited edition digipack that comes with this one. Race, it picks up in a very similar style set, it's just a dark cinematic kind of record with those, uh, you know, soundtrackish vibes. It would fit in, I mean, it almost sounds like he has this whole movie thing going in his head, he's just soundtracked this story in his head, because it's, it's so immersive and well done, and there's great use of field recordings, and just, it's really diverse too, it's not just uh, pure cinematic dark game. I have to say, it's just a really great record, it kind of straddles that border between being you know, what we've come to know as dark cinematic, ambient music, and soundtrackish music. And the reason why I say that is because some of it just, I guess it sounds like it was, the songs were literally composed for like a, a movie soundtrack or a cartoon or something like that. It, 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 it kind of, it goes above and beyond like dark cinematic ambient music, but still has that dark and haunting kind of characteristic to it. And there's some songs in particular that even kind of remind me of like old video game scores. I'm not saying like old, old like like 80s video game scores. I'm talking like late 90s like RPG kind of scores. Um, one song in particular actually reminds me of some of the the work that Yasunori Mitsuda did on the Xenogear soundtrack back in uh, I believe that was 90 or 99. And I don't know if you guys ever played Xenogears, but as one damn good soundtrack and one fucking really hard game. I haven't played it since I was a teenager, and I'm never gonna play it again because it fucked me up so much. But uh, it was fun uh, hearing a song that you know brought back memories of all of that, and uh, I've always you know loved uh, Mitsuda's music for that. So it was great to you know hear like something that reminded me of that because I always thought he had a really unique style. And it could be totally you know just uh, random that uh, Monde created a song that reminds me of that. But if uh, he was inspired by the Mitsuda, then he's definitely taking on good inspiration because that dude's one of the best when it comes to. Uh, video game scores. So, I mean, other than that, you know, it's just, uh, it has all, you know, a lot of great vibes going. There's some parts that are just, you know, super just dark and haunting, and other parts that are like, even a little melancholy and just strange and psychedelic and weird, and it's just, it's, it's a little bit all over the place, but I like that kind of thing. I think, uh, some people, when it comes to their, you know, their, their dark gaming music, they want something a little more cohesive and you know, me personally, whenever I set, my albums tend to be a little all over the place too, and I always strive to do that, and uh, one of the reasons why so many labels always turn me down, because they want everything to be cohesive and be marketable to the, the, the audiences out there and everything. And, and you know, I, I don't really give a shit, I guess. I'm just, you know, I, I like the fact that, you know, people like my music. And I'm sure Mo Moonbay appreciates all of his listeners too, but, you know, we everyone's got their style, and people just want to be all over the place. and. I really, you know, I really identify with his style, and I love what he's doing here, so it's, uh, it's great, you know, it's, uh, dark cinematic, ambient music at its best, really, and, uh, with soundtrackish vibes, and just, you know, all kinds of different emotions going, it's just a really great release, and, uh, check out his Bandcamp site, I haven't seen a whole lot of people buying it just yet, but hopefully this video will help, I think you guys will definitely enjoy his stuff, and, uh, if not, well, I'll be cursed the rest of my life if I waste your time, but I think this is a great release, well worth your time. Check it out, that's Race of the Appalachian by Mombe Yulman.
there's the front cover. And uh, again, totally homemade. It looks like he uh, had the album heart printed off and then he glued it to this digipack, which is, um, I guess, just made out of cardboard or paper. And then he painted some parts of it to make it stick or something. I don't know. He tied, tied together some twine and there's like a little like a sticky thing to hold it in here. It's a pretty cool little package. It also comes with a little burnt piece of paper giving you a little insight into the album and what it's all about and so on and so forth. Also get a little Mumbai Gilman sticker. And uh, I think the sticker too actually. Musician, composer, producer. Right on. So uh, definitely worth checking out. I think this album is only $10 to buy, and uh, I don't have the CDR in here right now, but it's the, one of those cool little like record looking uh, CDR things. So here's the inside too. Just curious. So that is Race of the Appalachian by Mombe Yulman. Highly recommend Cinematic Dark Gambit right here. Check it out. Another little quality album that's kind of been forgotten in time is Sombra's Transcending the Umbra. Released by Black Metal label Forever Plagued Records back in 2004. And uh, this is an album that I've had pretty much since its initial release back then. I believe in 2005 I got it because, uh, well, the guy that was responsible for this project, he was at the time writing for my zine, Lunar Hypnosis, and he had uh, basically sent me a copy of the album for review and just because he was a writer and wanted me to check out his music. And uh, I remember liking this album quite a bit, I've hung on to it all these years, even though it's, uh, I mean, it, it's a nice, great, straightforward album, and there's not really anything overly cinematic or deeply special about it, it's just a really just kind of quality, straightforward, cohesive, dark ambient release that I like. There's minimal experimentation, there's no, like no industrial characteristics, but still has this sort of old school vibe that it kind of reminds me of something that could have been on a cold mid industry or one of the old classic labels from the 90s and the 80s. Um, the person involved in the project was, uh, well I'm not going to say his name because it's not mentioned in the booklet and uh, I don't really know what happened to this individual. He wrote for my zine for a couple, no not even a couple years, maybe a year and he disappeared. But he also had a project called Clockwork Illusion which was a really interesting project so he seemed like he was a really uh, talented individual so I'm not really sure what happened to him. But uh, this is a nice little release that, uh, at least for me, it's one of those albums I can put on and just totally chill out to. It just it's, it settles my mind, it makes me calm, and uh, sometimes you kind of you just gotta get into those kind of releases with dark ambient music because uh, I think you know sometimes, especially nowadays, a lot of us get more into the cinematic stuff. And I mean, I love the cinematic dark ambient music, obviously, but uh, you know sometimes you just gotta go back to the basics, and do you know, just go to a totally just you know old school and just totally, you know, straightforward dark ambient release. And this is a uh, nice release that offers that kind of thing. And uh, there's very minimal, like, you know, melodic characteristics. It's very uh, kind of dark and droney, but not cavernous or really, you know, like, uh, you know, devoid of character kind of thing. And there's character there. It has even a minimal sort of soundtrackish kind of vibe to it. But it's uh, definitely something that, uh, you know, I think is worth checking out, especially if you're just into, you know, something kind of just uh, old school and, you know, straightforward and, you know, chill and relaxing, but still with a nice dark kind of character to it. And uh, this album often goes on sites like Discogs for like three or four bucks. And, uh, you know, it's well, something where if you got a little extra money to spend and you just, you know, you're trying to build up your dark gaming collection, it's totally worth checking out. I I believe I also got an upload on this channel, so you can check it out if you want. It's worth a listen, if nothing else. And uh, I think it might even be on Forever Plagues uh, and Campsite, too. So definitely worth looking up. It's Sombras is Transcending the Young. The front cover. And uh, let me actually take it out of there. It's probably glare. It's the front cover. It's only just a single page. And so it's a pretty basic forest theme going here. Same thing with the back of the insert. Nothing really special. I mean, it's uh, black and white forest stuff. Been there, done that. So, I mean, in a lot of ways, this release is typical. But like I said, you know, it's just... Uh, I guess it's just... Uh, I have enjoyed it because I knew the person uh, behind the project personally. So it's that connection for me personally. And uh, then the CD itself is just a black CD with... Uh, And I, I just noticed this now, but it's 
Former Plague Records, only since their second release, which is interesting because, as I said, they are nowadays known as a black metal label, so maybe in these early days they had considered other releases, uh, Dark Ambient and other, but yeah, just black metal nowadays. And then the back cover, uh, song titles, and, you know, not a whole lot going on there, but, you know, good design. It, it actually has really more of a black metal kind of aesthetic to the whole layout and the graphic design and everything, so... For all I know, this could be a black metal side project. I don't know. It uh, it definitely has some characteristics. It's something you kind of expect from a black metal musician to do because it does have sort of that Burzum-esque kind of uh, vibes to it at times. It does remind me of like Philos FM's uh, ambient tracks and stuff like that. But uh, regardless, I like this album and you should check it out. I've been using the word soundtrack a lot in my reviews tonight, so it only seemed fitting that I should actually finally review a soundtrack on this show. And... Uh, you know, you might think soundtrack on oh, breaking the theme of Dark Yambin, and well, to a point I am, but there's a lot of Dark Yambin characteristics in this particular soundtrack. And for me personally, this may have been one of the first times I actually heard Dark Yambin music. The soundtrack in question is the Biohazard 2 or Resident Evil 2 soundtrack, as it was known in America. Resident Evil 2 came out back in 1998, and at the time I was only 17 years old, and uh, for me that game made a huge, huge impact on me. I had already played the previous Resident Evil that came out in 1995, but Resident Evil 2 felt like the original game times like 50. It was so much better. The, the music was better, the storyline was better, the, <laughs> the acting was slightly better, and uh, the gore factor was just over the top for that time. It was a really special thing, and uh, I also, like, around that time period, I was really into, like, making websites and stuff like that, and it was really just uh, a lot of fun, you know, back in those days, building fanzines for, like, video games and music that I was into, and that's something I, like, really miss about the internet, something that somewhere along the way we just, we pushed it all aside in favor of, like, MySpace and then Facebook came along and I mean Facebook is still the big thing these days but it makes me sad that like every band and every everything it's just it's always about Facebook there's no personal websites anymore it's something that's really missable those early days of uh, the internet but anyway I'm really getting off task there so this Biohazard 2 original soundtrack came out in 1998 and I originally bought this I think I originally bought this from an old website called GameCave.com and GameCave was uh, just a really great place to buy import video games, soundtracks, anime, and just all kinds of stupid fucking nerdy Japanese stuff. And When I was in my late teens, I was all about the Japanese stuff. I mean, you can probably see I have some Japanese on me, I have a geisha tattooed on me, it's all stuff I got back. When I was in my late teens and early 20s, I was really, really into that sort of thing. And, uh, I mean, I still love it nowadays, but just it's very scaled back. I'm, but uh, it's still a part of me and my history, so, you know, and it's on my arm permanently now, something I can do about that unless I sever my arm off. But, God, I don't want to do that. So, <laughs> anyway, the Biohazard 2 soundtrack, man, that was something really special when it came out. It still is special all these years later, too. It's, uh... The soundtrack, and uh, like any soundtrack, it's very diverse. There's, a, you know, very, uh, you know, like dark cinematic pieces, and some that are very dramatic and action-packed to go with the more action scenes in the game. And of course, there are uh, some also some more melancholy and very peaceful sounding uh, synthesizer pieces and ambient pieces and stuff like that. There's also some songs, songs in the soundtrack that are very just dark droning and. Uh, very, very characteristic of dark ambient music. It's, uh, um, you know, it, it, some of these pieces actually sound like something that could have been on, uh, could have been on any band's, you know, record back in those days, too. It sounds like something that Cold Man Industry would have been interested in, something that I'm sure influenced uh, future generations of dark ambient artists. I know it was an influence on me, and I, I mean, you know, it's not just Resident Evil soundtrack. It was the Silent Hill one was really big for influence in the dark ambient scene. I mean, Atrium, uh, or sorry, Simon from Atrium Carcerate openly admits that Silent Hill was an influence for him in those early days of doing the project. So, you know, soundtracks aren't too far removed from, uh, or video game soundtracks, I'm sorry, aren't very far removed from dark ambient music. And this, at least in my opinion, is one of the best ones. So, I mean, it's diverse enough, and it's really, it, it's not, I mean, there's probably more other 
um, I guess, styles of music more so than dark ambient music in this particular soundtrack, but it, it flows pretty well and it has, you know, a dark vibe throughout. And I mean, there are a few kind of, there's like one like rockish kind of song, I guess, but that's like the special ending, so you don't, uh, you know, hear it in the game until you beat the, like, the B game. You guys even know what the hell I'm talking about here. Probably not. I'm getting nerdy about a video game that I haven't played in 20 years, but whatever. <laughs> well, that hasn't been that long. Well, whatever. It's been a while since I played Resident Evil 2. But I have recently played the Resident Evil 2 remake, which, if you haven't played it, I highly recommend it. That's really good. And I'm, once again, diverging here from the soundtrack. But anyway. So, the Biohazard 2 soundtrack, Resident Evil 2 soundtrack, is uh, quite a little gem. It's, uh... It might sound dated to some ears if you didn't hear it back in the day, but for me, it always, uh, it brings back a really special time in my life. It brings back that, uh, those carefree teenage days, the days of just, you know, when I could just spend a whole day playing video games and not give a shit, and, you know, days when I had basically, uh, unlimited amount of money because I lived with my parents, and I wasn't, I was just in high school, and nothing really mattered other than just music and taking it easy and just being a careless teenager and, uh, something I miss, and I'm sure lots of people miss these days, because nowadays I'm really, like, incapable of, you know, just standing still and relaxing. It's, as I said earlier, it's both a blessing and a curse for me, but at least I feel like I've, I'm doing something worthwhile with my life. I'm always creating or producing or something, or, you know, doing something around the house, you know, I guess. I don't know how to explain it, but really special time for me, and, uh, yeah, that was the Biohazard 2 Resident Evil 2 soundtrack, and it's definitely worth, uh, Look it up and check it out if you haven't heard it. the front cover and it uh you know features a nice zombie ripping or well not that doesn't rip them maybe i'm thinking of the t-shirt i had where like the claws would look like they're ripping through flesh i wish i still had that t-shirt by the way it goes for a lot of money on ebay nowadays but there's a front cover it says biohazard 2 as i already mentioned it was known as biohazard in uh japan and the reason why it wasn't able to be released as the biohazard name and in America, so I believe, because the uh, American band Biohazard had a copyright on them, so that's why they had to change it to Resident Evil. So there's the front cover once more, and the back of the booklet. And an uh, interesting thing to note is uh, this version I have of it is actually a bootleg copy of the soundtrack, and uh, it's a very common thing in Japanese, uh, in Japan, for soundtracks to animes and video games and uh, even like their, their their pop and rock artists to have bootleg CDs. And I guess the reason for that is because, um, so, for some reason, these Japanese CDs there they've always been just absurdly expensive. Like I, uh, like I said, I think I bought this from the Game Cave website at a discounted price, but I remember, like, most, like, single CDs for, like, soundtracks back in those days was, like, anywhere from, like, 25 to $30, and, I mean, I, I never understood really the reasoning for that, but it drove me crazy, so that's why I sometimes got these bootleg CDs, which, as far as I know, are identical to the original releases. The only difference is it says SM Records, like, on the CD and on, like, the back here, too, as you can see. And another one, uh, oh, this is the Sanne one. There's a few other bootleg companies, too, that were just notorious for making uh, just tons of uh, like, almost authentic-looking copies of, uh, you know, game soundtracks, anime soundtracks, and Japanese pop and rock artists. They were really notorious for it. And I, I, as far as I know, they're still going, maybe not, I don't know. But, uh, yeah, so this is the back cover. And uh, 
this is I bought this 21 years ago and I, I thought about that recently and it really made me feel old. I was like, wow. I bought this back in 1998 and just really, yeah, it really made me feel old and I don't know how I feel about that. But uh, as I said, good memories with this one. And uh, even better memories when I was at the record store a few months ago and uh, I came across this. The Resident Evil 2 soundtrack on vinyl. Oh yes. So, it is the same exact content of that CD I just showed you. But of course on glorious vinyl. And uh, I have to admit, I've been very, very obsessed with vinyl the, the past few months, and uh, I'm not really sure what the catalyst was, because I've always liked vinyl, I just never really obsessively bought it until the, the past couple months. And uh, I bought so much vinyl that I sort of put myself in a mini debt and really fucked myself bad. And like the past two, well, like the past like month, I've had like anywhere from like well, after bills were paid, I had like maybe like hundred dollars to pay to play with between each pay period of work. It was pretty horrible, and every time I'd have to go buy something, I was paying with uh, coins and stuff. It was just totally embarrassing. But whatever, I got a lot of cool vinyl, so I don't give a shit too much anyway. <laughs> so there's the back cover, and you can see all the track listings and everything. And uh, of course, this is an official release. This. Uh, vinyl and the inside has a picture of the raccoon police department police station and uh if you never played the game basically uh, you get sort of trapped inside the raccoon police station and try to find a way out of the zombie infested city which uh well isn't bound determined to eat you alive and turn you into a zombie and it's double vinyl, and I'm only going to show you one of the vinyls, because they're basically exactly alike. It comes on a nice black vinyl. I feel like red would have been a better option, just, you know, because all the gore and everything involved, but what can you do? It also comes with uh, what they call a OB strip. Um, these are very very common in Japanese CDs and media I don't really know why but uh, Laced Records I think is actually a I think it was an uh, English company that pr pressed this on 100 gram vinyl they decided to still uh, you know keep that same kind of aesthetic that uh, Japanese CDs and stuff has where it has these oldies and so that's what that is there so that is the Resident Evil 2 Biohazard soundtrack uh, a great soundtrack of dark, crazy, haunting, dramatic, cinematic music, and uh, some great dark ambient tunes, which for me, I think, uh, was probably the first time I ever heard dark ambient music, and uh, I know Mortis was the first time I heard the term dark ambient, and that was in, I think, late 1999, if I remember correctly, but, you know, if this game, you know, this game came out in 1998, I bought it the day it came out, so I may have uh, discovered dark ambient music sooner than I thought. I am a veteran of this genre. So anyway, if you haven't heard it, check it out. It's a great little soundtrack while we have time. And if you haven't played uh, the original, it's worth checking out. If you're into vintage gaming, it sounds weird saying that, that, that this game is vintage, cause it's, but it is that old. And uh, the, the remake is definitely worth checking out, too. It's a great faithful remake of that great classic game. So yeah, give it a try. So one more little thing before we call it a night. Uh, I want to talk about a little festival in Norway called the Midgards Block Metal Festival. Wait, metal? Why am I talking about metal on the dark and the inner sanctum vlog? Well, the reason why is because there's also a good mixture of other music at this festival, like some pagan folk stuff, and uh, also Jan Roger Peterson of Savartsen curates the dark ambient stage, and at this dark ambient stage will be Savartsen, Rosin de Etra, and Treha Saktori. Uh, three projects that are of ob obviously the highest caliber and the, some of the best in the dark ambient scene. And uh, this festival, I almost wish I hadn't learned about it because it sounds so fucking awesome and so like just in line with what I'm like into these days in my life. It's got it's very heavily Viking themed and pagan themed, which is. Uh, something I've been very much into for a long time now and there's rituals there's uh, all kinds of uh, like I guess there's like sacrifices it looks like from the videos I've seen and uh, 
there's just a lot of cool pagan bands and uh, like there's a Viking village, there's lots of craft beer to try and lots of like Viking and pagan themed shops I'm sure too and it just looks like it's going to be a really great time and uh, I really wish I had more than $50 in my bank account right now so I could go. Uh, so if anyone wants to pay for me to go to Norway and go to this festival, please make a dream come true for me. But if you happen to be in Norway or anywhere in on European soil and you can make it to this fest, it sounds like it's really going to be a great time. And not just for the, you know, the dark ambient bands, there's also other cool bands like High Lungs playing and Slave, Gall's Beard, and uh, some other bands that sounded really queer, too. uh, queer? I didn't say that. Well, anyway, so many bands that sounded really cool, too, so anyway, definitely worth checking out. And if you can go to it, well, have a fun time and send me pictures and videos later on so I can get jealous. So, alright, check it out. Well guys, thanks as always for checking out the Inner Sanctum and joining me once again here for episode 11. I know it has been a big gap between episodes, but at this point it should be pretty obvious that's just the way I'm going to do this show. And uh, all I can say is I, I'm, I'm only going to do them when motivation's there. Motivation was here this weekend, so there you go. Hopefully it wasn't uh, too much of a struggle to get through this episode with me. And uh, hopefully you enjoyed it and you got some new stuff to check out. Um, all three of those releases are really great. and I. Nothing worth looking up, buying them, or you know, if nothing else, check them on YouTube and you know, give them a go. They're good stuff. Um, I'd like to say I'll be back in a few weeks with that cryo chamber special, but I can't make any promises. But I will definitely try my best. And uh, until then, be cool to each other. Thanks for supporting dark ambient music. And uh, other than that, uh, have a good day. Have a good day.